Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Collider Heroes. This is episode 37. I'm John Schnepp, and we're going to talk about the world of superheroes, supervillains, and we're not going to talk about Star Wars. Not talking about Star Wars. We've got a full plate of amazing guests featuring Robert Meyer Burnett. You know him as the editor-director of Free Enterprise and the amazing upcoming Axonar. Thanks for being and on the, the show. And the president of the J.J. Abrams Star Trek Club. <laughs> That's right. He loves them. It's good Star to be Trek. back. You know, I want to thank all the uh, sweaties for sending me links to the Hot Toys Batman v Superman uh, unveiling of the Batmobile. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to pre-order it. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's a very expensive toy. And if you like those adult expensive toys, you'll like Robert Meyer Burnett. <laughs> Another amazing guest we have. We have regular John Campia, the guy who went to the world, world premiere of Star Wars yesterday, but we're not going to talk about Star Wars today. Yes, and you're going to Star Wars in about two hours, yes. but we're not going to talk we're about Star Wars We're not talking about today. Star Wars. No. Thanks for being on the show. <laughs> and a very special guest. I'm very happy to have him on. Max Landis. He is the yes. writer of Chronicle, American Ultra, Victor Frankenstein. Shh about that one. And <laughs> one of my favorite comic books that has come out in the last couple of years that features a character superman he is the writer of a limited series a one through seven limited series that's coming out right now tomorrow you can actually get it in stores go to your local comic book store and pick up superman american alien issue two max landis ladies yeah, and gentlemen thank you also uh you, some of you guys may not heard about it but my movie a movie I wrote, right? Star Wars: The Force Awakens, comes out <laughs> this Thursday. You it's wrote an, that? It's you did an, a great job, by the way. It's Man, an independent film, but we got some great Max actors. Max Lucas is your name. Max, Max Lucas. Okay. No, I, actually, uh, my last name is Max Abrams, like J.J. <laughs> Abrams. I was raised in the film industry, although no one talks about that regarding <laughs> him. Interesting, uh, but I think the movie's really good. Uh, it's story of everyone's favorite character, young Anakin. We go back to the start. Oh, you're talking about Phantom Menace. We got J no. I'm talking about Star Wars: The Force Awakens. Oh, uh, okay. Spoilers. It's all about Jake Lloyd as young Anakin. We have CGI'd <laughs> him into a New Hope to replace R2D2. Uh, this we're is very an excited. experimental Star Wars movie. Uh, well, it's it's the first is, since uh, Revenge of the Sith. So we wow. really want to do something special. Well, I can't wait to get. We'll get real. Let's wait about an hour and let's get really into Star Wars. Now but, this is Pod Race. Yes. <laughs> All right, first off the bat, we've got X-Men Apocalypse. We're going to talk about the trailer that popped off last week. Uh, it's the very first look that we have of Brian Singer's brand new X-Men film. It's written by Simon Kinberg. As I mentioned, the final look of Apocalypse is quite different from the purple Ivan Ooze picks that dropped like in the Entertainment Weekly a couple months back. Uh, Oscar Isaacs is playing Apocalypse, and here's what he had to say about the movie. I love Apocalypse. I grew up collecting X Factor. I remember when the first comic book came out, and for me, especially because I grew up in a religious household, I knew about the book of Revelations, the second coming, the apocalypse. Then you see this comic book character that's supposed to embody all of these ideas. For some people, they just thought he was this big blue guy and it was a survival of the fittest, but for me, that was less interesting. The most interesting part for me was the biblical aspect and the end of the world and the revelation of the way things were before. So what are you guys' thoughts on the newest X-Men Apocalypse trailer? Max, let's start with you. You just saw it. Uh... I, I don't care. I mean, I'll, pro I'll probably see it because I really liked Last Stand. Mm -hmm. I liked X2. X-Men 1's good. Mm -hmm. um, I don't care. I, I watched it and I was like, wow, another superhero movie. And it, it watching it gave me this bizarre emotion of this looks like a cartoon, but it doesn't look like the cartoon I want to see. Mm -hmm. X-Men The Last Stand ended with this incredibly rewarding for fan sequence where it was like, we're finally at X-Men, there's, you know, fucking James Marsden. There's all the characters who you want. They're all here now. We're going to have an X-Men movie, and the X-Men movie will have Cyclops and Rogue, and maybe Gambit will show up, and Nightcrawler, and all of the people who we wanted to see in one movie. They're going to be in one movie, at, finally, because we haven't gotten that yet. And to go back to the past now just feels like... Well, we can't have Jennifer Lawrence in the present. Well, you keep saying X-Men Last Stand. You mean X-Men Days of Future Days Past. Days of Future Past. I was going to uh, say, Last Stand is the worst you movie hand, ever. You have to hand in your nerd credit card yeah. right now. If you, were, if you were talking about Last Stand, but you're talking about future Days Days of Future yeah, well, Past. Okay. I, if I never hand in my nerd credit card, because if I was really a nerd, I'd be an apologist for that movie. <laughs> whereas, la, la, whereas Days of Future Past was like quite good. Yeah. I, I just I'm in a place where I don't know why we're in the past, especially if it's been guaranteed to us by the end of Days of Future Past that everything turns out fine. Like the second they did that, they made this movie irrelevant by setting it in the past. And maybe that's like a dorky problem to have, but I'll probably see it. I don't I don't care about what happened in the 80s. I don't, I just don't care. How about you, John? What do you think of the trailer? Underwhelmed. I didn't hate it. 
Um, I, and everybody knows I'm really looking forward to it. I absolutely loved Days of Future Past. I love all three X-Men movies that Brian Singer's done. Yep. I love all of them. And I really like what they did. And I'm completely with you, Max, on the thing that that movie ended with giving us the opportunity to have a fresh start. Now, I get it. We've got uh, Michael Fassbender. Um, and we've got uh, 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 who's playing the young Professor Xavier? James, James McAvoy. McAvoy. Uh, we got McAvoy, and they're a great tandem. They're a mm -hmm. great team. But I, I got to agree with Max in the sense that it feels like the reason the time period was picked was just so they could use Jennifer Lawrence again. And it feels like they're breaking my my personal big rule, which is don't make the story serve an actor, make the actor serve the story. And it feels like they're doing it the wrong way. Now look, it's still Brian Singer doing an X Men film, and he's batting a thousand when it comes to those right now. So I'm excited for it, but I will admit the the trailer underwhelmed me. All right, how about you, Robert? Well, look, X-Men to me is is my the Star Trek of comic books. I've loved the X-Men since I was a kid, and you know, to see Apocalypse who was always a goofy character in the comics, let's face it, he was. But I love the portrayal that Oscar Isaac seems to be going for. I mean, I loved when he that moment when he says you know me as Ra, you know, Yahweh, Krishna. I mean, it seems to be, again, a very intellectually interesting movie as far as all of the films that we're getting as opposed to other trailers that might have dropped right after that right. that aren't so intellectually interesting. But I thought that the, the movie looked good to me and it was intriguing. The, the teaser was not as good as the Days of Future Past mm -hmm. teaser. Find My Hope or whatever that, right. that first teaser right. was great. But I'm excited. I mean, I, I can't believe they made a movie with Apocalypse in it. Yeah, you know, I'm yeah, going to... I, I myself, it. I like the trailer. I'm going to withhold judgment as far as until I see another trailer. I think this was a good tease for me of X-Men Apocalypse. I loved X-Men Days of Future Past. I thought it was exactly where the X-Men franchise needed to go. I agree with you guys. I love the ending, but we haven't seen this movie yet. We don't know if that ending actually has something to do with this movie or not, whether they jump right into the 80s. We know that everything is different, and that's what happened at the end of X-Men Days of Future Past. It was kind of rebooting the X-Men and trying to get it back on path. So I don't know what their story is going to really be. I know it's obviously set in the 80s, but I don't know how they're going to tie in the last, ep the ending of episode of Days of Future Past with X-Men Apocalypse. Remember, but I, I liked what I saw. In the Halls of Fox, there are two words engraved in marble. Marble. We've talked about this right. before. On one wall is engraved the word continuity. On the other wall is engraved the word schmontinuity. Mm -hmm. They don't care. Mm -hmm. They've never cared about maintaining continuity. No and comment. Here's, and here's the sad thing. Here's the sad thing. All right. This Apocalypse trailer comes out. I found the Deadpool announcement of a new trailer coming more entertaining than the actual trailer of X-Men Apocalypse. That that thing with Deadpool with Ryan Reynolds sitting in Santa's chair sure. saying he's got the next most interesting lap to sit on, that to me was far more entertaining than this trailer. Well, this trailer. maybe they'll tie it in. It is the same Maybe family. they will tie it in. Um, let's great. move on. We're going to talk about series versus movies. Now, we're at the point that in this coming year, we'll have seven big budget films and 11 serialized programs for us to watch in 2016. We've got Deadpool, Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, Captain America, Civil War, X-Men, Apocalypse, Doctor Strange, and Gambit coming out next year in theaters. While we have Daredevil, Arrow, Luke Cage, Flash, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Gotham, Legends of Tomorrow, Agent Carter, Preacher, The Walking Dead, and Supergirl in our living rooms. That's a little mouthful right there. That's a lot Jesus of... Jesus Christ. Yeah, if it was insane. 2002, I would be so excited about all that. <laughs> I know, stuff. right? It's like, what is going on? So and we now move... they're coming out, I'm like, oh, God. Well, we're in the future now. We've got what delivery formats do you guys think are going to be the dominant ones? Do you find that movies are still the way to go with adapting comic books and graphic novels? Or do you think the serialized format where you have 10 to 20 episodes is the way to go? Let's start with you, John. What do you it think? It honestly, it depends on the title. I mean, the, the biggest and the best, where you get your biggest budget, your best production, you get your whole story told in the span of 130 minutes or something along those lines, movies, absolutely. But then you get some stuff like Daredevil was, right? I mean, Daredevil, which is very modest budget, they they wanted to tell over slow burn. They had a you know, thirteen or however many episodes the first season. Why I can't somewhere between eleven and thirteen episodes, that worked better for that story. Movies are always going to be the holy grail though that that they're going to be going for. That's where they're going to make a billion dollars and, and stuff like that. But it depends on the story. I like what they're doing with their Netflix stuff right now because Jessica Jones. As much as I wasn't a fan of the Jessica Jones series, mm -hmm. but. Telling it on Netflix was the right move. I love Daredevil. Telling it on Netflix was the right move. So it all depends on the individual story and what it lends itself to better. How about you, Max? 
Compulsive viewing is over. The last compulsive viewing movie that will exist is Star Wars and it comes out this week. It's also gonna be the last big premiere. Compulsive viewing is over. It's dead, it's gone. Uh, Breaking Bad became compulsive viewing. I guess Game of Thrones might be, although people are dropping off that too. I think all formats are are falling apart. And the, the, the fact that we have, in the modern age, now lean so far into escapist genres that things that were considered niche 30 years ago are now the norm. I mean, I think we're done. I think I think movies and TV are both done. And uh, I don't know what's next, but I think within 10 years, none of this will matter. So I don't think there is a good format. I think the fact that we have leaned so far into comics, which are serialized, and books like Game of Thrones, which are serialized, shows that there is a franticness, a franticness, uh, to draw in repeat customers. And uh, I think everything's fucked and it's pretty dark. <laughs> I, I'm gonna watch two of the things you just listed. Which two? Um, probably Captain America Civil War because I liked uh, the second Captain America film and I can't remember the other one so maybe I won't watch that. <laughs> but uh, but uh, you know, there's too many movies. I don't wanna see a Gambit movie. I, I, I wanna see Gambit and Rogue. Like, like I, I don't understand who these movies are for anymore. Because there was a moment where they were for everyone, but who is Star Trek Beyond for? It's right. not for Star Trek fans. Who is? I mean, X Men Apocalypse, I guess, is for people who liked Days of Future Past. But it's like, you know, there's no who is Batman versus Superman for? Why they show us Doomsday in the trailer? Who's this for? Only some people will know who Doomsday is. People who don't know who Doomsday is are like, that's a dumb-looking gray monster. So it's like. What is this? I don't know. I give up. My answer to your question is, I give up. Right. It's all over. Burn it all down. Okay. <laughs> Robert, how, about, how do you respond to something like well, that? Well, you know, I can definitely see your point of view, but I think, look, since the dawn of time, people have loved to have stories told to them. They love, people love to hear great stories. And we're now in a position where 10 years ago, like you said, the technology didn't exist to bring us the kind of things that we're seeing, especially on television. You know, when you watch a flash television show and they're doing that many effects yeah. in an hour, it's amazing. What they did in Chronicle, I think Chronicle has the best flying effects ever done put on film. I mean, it looks it looks amazing. Where if you look at a flying movie 10 years ago, you couldn't have done that. Right. So it's, I'm, I'm of the opinion that as long as the story's great, it is the tale, not he who tells it. That's what Stephen King said. And I think if we live in a world where we're getting great storytellers allowed to tell great stories, that's that's a very good thing. It's just when they have to be marketed, that's the problem. Like you said, you put Doomsday in a trailer, who is that for? I mean, unless you've read The Death of Superman and you know Dan Juergen's work, and right. it doesn't. you look at it and go, wait a minute, I want to see a movie, Batman v Superman. Why do you have to throw everything that's in that movie at me? at once mm -hmm. let me go and figure it out myself well yeah i think the fear with the batman v superman is if the marketing team was fearful and they just they wanted to get as much out to the entire world as possible and that's i think that was a big mistake i think you know i agree with all of you guys i think the key is giving the keys back to the creatives i think the the problem that we have in uh in the modern world right now with entertainment media tv movies you name it is a a a homogenization and a, and a smoothing out of what used to be pure creativity so that it can appeal to all the masses. Now, comic books, it, you know, especially comics in the 70s and 80s and 90s, were not made to appeal to the masses. They were made to appeal to a very small niche group of readers. And I think that's why so much creativity was was spawned and allowed to happen because of the, the masters were not shackling those who were working. So when you have something now, it has to appeal to everyone. You get a smoothed out kind of like blander version of what the people who actually liked the original source material are getting, you know, or what they used to get. So I it's, think it's worse than that because it, it's 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 so bizarre. One of the most bizarre things that's happening is everything starting to look like everything else. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, like if you pick up a, a Spider-Man comic, an X-Men comic, a Superman comic, and a Batman comic from like 1998 even, they look different. Right. And it's not just because of different artists, it's because there's a different tone. But I mean like if this X-Men trailer at the end of it had been a different thing, at like any different thing, if it was an Avengers trailer and it had all the same dialogue and the same shots but the Avengers were in it, 
I mean, it looks the same. It all looks the same. I don't. I don't know. I'm. I'm just. Maybe I'm being a bitch about it, but it. The lack of type of the fact that there is now a type of movie mm -hmm. that is a superhero movie, as opposed to in the comics where Captain America is a spy action comic, Spider Man is like a dramedy about an action dramedy. Right. You know, fucking Punisher is like a hardcore thriller. Now everything's sort of the same genre of superhero movie where at the end the big thing goes into the sky. You know how many big things I saw go in the sky in that fucking trailer? So many big things went up into the sky. And it's the same shit that goes up to this guy in every single one of these movies. Right. It's like playing the, it's like playing a fucking NES game. <laughs> you know, at the end, the thing goes in the sky. You don't hit the thing and you collect the little things. In every NES game, you're jumping to collect little things. Not everyone, but uh, shut up. Shut shut up, internet. Not every one of them, but you see what I'm saying. Yeah. It's the same formula again and again and again. That's why I liked Days of Future Past. Even though at the end, a big thing went up in the sky. Sure. Well, you know, look, I think what we're seeing with television, though, is there is a difference. Jessica Jones for me it was a very edgy, dark, adult, hard-hitting show. And that would only have happened, I think, on Netflix. You'd never see that in the movie theater. Right. And Game of Thrones, with that subject matter, you know, Benioff, Benioff and Weiss, the showrunners, like you were talking about creativity, television is where creators are going now to have more freedom. Mm -hmm. I'm doing two TV shows next year, so is it, it better is be. That, is that because, like, as a showrunner? Yes, 100%. A su supposedly, I'll have more freedom. I guess we'll see. But now then, okay, as a storyteller, do you feel that you're going to be free then to tell a much longer story and have it unravel, say, the way a great Stephen King novel will? It's it's interesting. Uh, that That's a great question, and I guess I'll find out. The... Uh, the writing process on both my TV shows has been, yeah, actually, extremely compared to studio films. You know, I'm moving completely out of the studio film mm -hmm. space is my goal. And moving into indies and where there's no money and TV where there's less money. But ideally, I'll be able to do something good that I can lay my hands on. Well, like, cause yeah. I, I relate most to my YouTube stuff, so I'm talking about me now. But no, I mean, time. well, we were talking earlier about like what is what's satisfying is when you're actually able to see something from beginning to end and see it through with your vision, and those are the things that you're able to do a through per perseverance and keeping your creativity in check. It's like you're the only person who's going to be able to see an idea of yours from beginning to end. If you give it away to someone else, it's going to become a hodgepodge of ideas. Is Jessica and Jones really that good? Jessica Jones is actually really I good. really thought it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're, it's, it's we amazing like how it. I I thought look, I thought it lost its focus the further it went along. Like but Daredevil. It, it's amazing how dark though that show really got. Yeah. I mean, if you really want to look at it as a metaphor, it's it's Jessica Jones is pretty much about what every modern woman faces navigating the world that we live in today. As a metaphor, it, it was a it, to me it was a horror story about what what it's like to be a woman in her 30s. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, once you once about. you put Zab Kilgrave into something. Once Purple Man is on the page, <laughs> things are going to get dark. They yeah, do. Yeah. And they do. They get really dark. But so, for everyone in that show, every woman is a, is a victim of, of everyone in, in, that, in that series. Every woman I talk to acts like she's a victim of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Max Landis is a misogynist. Sorry. Hey, speaking of victims, guys, let's talk about Tarzan. This, uh, this week, a uh, Legend of Tarzan <laughs> came out, a brand new trailer. Uh, I don't know if you guys all got a chance to check it out, but it's uh, Alexander Skarsgård plays Tarzan. Margot Robbie plays Jane. It looked like a, it could be a lot of fun. It, to, it, to me, it kind of reminded me of like some kind of bizarre crossover of Indiana Jones meets uh, you know, the, you know, the Planet of the Apes. I don't know. It was a very weird. Uh, judgment's out for me. What do you think, John? I... Look, I had absolutely no hope for, for this prize. It sounded like another generic kind of thing they were going to do. There was an incarnation of a Tarzan story told a number of years ago with uh, Christopher Lambert right. called Lord of Greystoke. Yeah. Lord of Greystoke, which I thought was... I didn't love the movie, but I love the concept. I love what they were kind of trying to do with that movie. And it seems like they're trying to incorporate a bit of that into this one as well. I, I got to admit, I was very pleasantly surprised by the trailer. I was not expecting to like anything about it. Then I sat down and watched it. There's a couple things near the end of the trailer that lost me a little bit. But that aside, um, I find myself now after watching the trailer having a lot more excitement about watching the movie than I did like a week ago. Sure. So, I, so in that case, the trailer did its job. Max, did you get a chance to see it? Yeah. How did these guys get so ripped? When did it become <laughs> like... When did, do you know how much dieting and like working out on different machines and training every day you have to do to get that ripped? When did that become... I mean, like, women... Back in the day, usually in these movies, don't look ripped. Uh, they look ripped in modern stuff because 
there are different standards of beauty now. But like all these guys in 300 and Tarzan and why are they so cut? Like I get that it's hot, <laughs> but like it affects me because I try, I work out and I see other guys who work out and the only guys who get that cut like eat six chicken breasts a day and do CrossFit all day, every day and are all idiots. <laughs> and like, I'm like, why is everybody so cut? I like that. You know what? If, if, <laughs> if there was a real Tarzan, he would look like me. Like, look at those apes. They have giant bellies. Be hanging out eating some bananas. I'd be that Tarzan. Well, he probably if we were, like, he'd subscribing probably be to strong, that. but he'd look like real strong. Oh, that guy looked crazy strong. Like, yeah, he's like drinking creatine and like just lifting baby apes. Yeah, you know, he's got a couple of yeah, charm. yeah, two gorillas. I don't know how these guys get so fucking. What do you think, Robert? You ripped. know, I mean, it looked fine to me. I, I just, I was more excited for the Jungle Book. You know the live. I action, still am. The live I still action Jungle am. Book. When I saw the trailer, I'm like, "There's no way anyone is going to get me to go see this movie." Right. And I watched the trailer, and I'm like, "Scarlett Johansson as as the serpent." I'm mm -hmm. like, "Are you kidding me?" I'm so in. I looked at this, and I'm thinking, "Is this the is this the beginning of a new shared universe? Is Mowgli and Tarzan going to like team up? Is Warner <laughs> Brothers and Disney going right. to put their their jungle franchises together?" I mean, like you said, that's why I felt it looked the same. Yeah. Like I, I look, and you see the same CGI apes right. that look that they look they probably came over from the new apes movie. Sure. You know after they finished warring, got they, a bunch of apes. In. It's it, hard to find good ape actors in Hollywood. It is, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> so ever union. since Rick Baker That's retired, union. Yeah. apes have not been the same, That's man. That's right. And I, it's just I can't. It, it, I don't know. I mean, I like Tarzan, but Tarzan was always the Mego action figure that I played with the least. Yeah, the one that I didn't get, actually, for myself. See, I, I didn't I want just, him. I didn't like it because he had a, a flesh-colored stock. Right, with a weird, like, cloth. yeah, And I always wanted him to be part of the Justice League or the Avengers, no. but he just wasn't. <laughs> uh, give me Buana Beast or some even weirder dude. What's it, uh, it's Tarzan, but he wears a bug mask, you know? But, I mean, look, it looks handsomely crafted and beautifully made. Yeah, like Christoph Waltz is in there, so hey, you know. Hey, but, the, all those actors cost $10 now. <laughs> there, there are like 12 actors who are still expensive. Every other actor you like can be bought cheap and put next to a CGI ape. And they all want to do it. It seems like they all want to be in these movies. Well, I, I can't wait to buy at least 10 of these actors and put them next to a strange stick figure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's, speaking of stick figures, let's get right into the Star Trek Beyond trailer. Uh, Star Trek. I can't stand uh, it. Star I know you Trek it. has had many lives via comic books and has gone through so many different television series and films. The newest trailer dropped for the third film that exists in some sideways pocket universe, multiverse, transdimensional place. Uh, that isn't the real Star Trek. It's separate from all the other Star Treks. Sabota sabotage the system. Spock, sabotage the system, just for you Shatner fans. Let's talk about the Beastie Boy-themed trailer. I'm going to save Robert for last. I want to talk first. Max, what did you think of this Star Trek Beyond trailer? It's a great uh, Farscape trailer. <laughs> it's a cool Guardians of the Galaxy 2 trailer. It's a really good Galaxy Quest 2 trailer. It's not a Star Trek trailer. Uh, you know, who knows? I haven't seen the movie. It's possible the movie could be great. I feel and have felt since the first Star Trek. Oh, God, this will get me in trouble. I feel like Star Trek's over. I, I loved Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, and I loved Voyager. And I love the I love parts of the original series, and I like a lot of those movies. Uh it's over. It's the what the, this this ended it. It's done. This is it's done. This is a tricorder and a communicator and everything. And so like when they're like trying to make it cool and they have that guy who looks like by the way he's from every other movie ever in his black. <laughs> he's a villain from Guardians of the Galaxy. They got one of the random grunt guys from Guardians <laughs> of the Galaxy as the main villain. They have a girl. They have the bad guys from Hellboy Two, the Golden Army, are the villains. They, everything looks the same. Why is he on a motorcycle? Why are they listening to, oh, let's put on Beastie Boys. It's like, ba with the ba, da bang, da bang, explosion, explosion. It's like, what the <laughs> fuck is this? And you watch it and it's just like, oh, Star Trek's over. And maybe the new series will be great. And maybe it isn't over, but it's not a science fiction film. It's an action film. If you're doing Star Trek, the thing no one has tried to do, all of the good Star Trek movies, are one of them's about a naval battle fueled by personal revenge. One of them's about going back in time and saving the whales. One of them is about a complicated political situation. And those are the good Star Trek movies. All the best Star Trek episodes don't involve running and shooting. And then this movie is like, Yo, wah, 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 boom, boom, <laughs> wah! Yeah. And I was like, what the what? fuck is this? Like, <laughs> yeah. who is this for? The strange and hellish. John Campia, what are your thoughts on the trailer? I did not hate the trailer, but I mean, look. I didn't the, hate it either. The, the Beastie Boys, the Beastie Boys music in it was completely out of place. 
Um, as opposed to the other Star Trek trailers when they came out for their films, which got me excited for the films every time, this one did not. I was just, okay. And now, I do find it interesting. We talked about this on Movie Talk. I find it interesting. It seems like this is going to be the first of the new breed of Star Trek movies that is going to be planet side based as opposed to in space based. So I think that's interesting. You'll see where they go for that. But I think what a lot of people forget, I'm about to get an earful from Robert, I know. But what a lot of people forget is that Star Trek, before that first J.J. Abrams franchise came along, I'm sorry, this is the truth. Buckle up, yell all you want at the monitor. This is the truth. Star Trek was dead. Yeah. It was dead and buried and gone. No pulse, no breathing, no new fans. The fans were literally dying off. It wasn't attracting any new audience Nemesis, members. Nemesis, resurrection, <laughs> boom. <laughs> I mean, the, the ratings for the shows continued to do this. The interest in the movies continued to wane. Star Trek was dead. So every time I hear somebody come up to me, it's not like the original. Your original is gone and it's dead. And if they try to keep doing what the original did, it would still be dead. But what they did, they, re they reinvigorated the franchise. Does it, is it similar to the original stuff? Yes, it's similar. Is it identical to the original stuff? Absolutely not. They changed a lot of the DNA. And when, in doing that, they created a brand new generation of fans in Star Trek that older fans keep telling us we're not real fans. So, I mean, here's the thing. Is this trailer really good? Nope. No, it's not. But it's not reflective of the, of the failure of the new Star Trek franchise. It's just reflective of it's a failure of a trailer. And I still think the movie's going to be good. Mm -hmm. I don't know that, but I'm kind of crossing my fingers. But even I, the defender of Star Trek, the new ones, I got to say, it's not a good job they did in the trailer. No. Let me say this about the trailer. I watched it and I hated it. I, I can't express how much I hated it. Within the first 10 seconds, I hated it because I was okay with them. You know, Scotty, like, what's that music? And you hear the Beastie Boys because they've already introduced, if you didn't know, in the very first Star Trek, Kirk's a Beastie Boys fan. His, his parents kept around this strange relic that he would listen to, and it was the Beastie Boys. So him playing it made sense. He's oh, it's just some music I'm listening to. And then that's when the Guardians of the Galaxy thing hit me. I'm like, they're doing Kirk's yeah. mixtape. Yeah. They're doing mixtape number one of Star Trek. And then you got, I think that's Kirk on a motorcycle. You got kung fu fighting. You have explosions. You have everything that isn't an action film, like, say, Star Trek II Wrath of Khan. They had action. They had lasers. They had, you know, people fighting. But it wasn't done like this. And I feel like the way that they're trying to sell or hard sell Star Trek Beyond is once again that kind of fear bait that a lot of studios get. They're like, well, we got to make sure they got Justin Lin and action director. I mean, I thought that was weird just in itself. Like, why are you getting Justin Lin, a Fast and the Furious director, to do Star Trek? It just doesn't even make sense. But then you hear about Orsi getting fired. The the script he made was it was too much. Like he said, the reason I got fired is because they said it was too too Star Trekky. The script that he wrote for Star Trek was too Star Trek. -y. I don't so, believe that Robert Orsi wrote a script that was too Star Trek. -y. Well, I don't believe that. All right, well, I'm just fired. saying this is what I heard. So neither do I. Yeah. <laughs> hey, look, this is what I heard. So, what, regardless of that, this is what we're getting. We're getting some action packed. Guardians of the Galaxy style Star Trek and maybe that's going to appeal to the people who like those kinds of films but to me at least it didn't feel like even remotely a Star Trek it didn't feel like I was in a Star Trek universe except for that guy looks like Spock what about that that scene between Spock and McCoy though when there's like at least I'm going to die it's fine. I won't I die gotta alone I gotta did that not feel no, Star Trek -y? it did and, and that's what I, I'll say that I haven't seen the film. I want the film to be really good. And I also am one of those people who I like the very first Star Trek reboot. And also, I did not hate Star Trek in a darkness. I have problems with it. Klingon, uh, Tribble Blood. There's a lot of things that we can get into if magical we wanted to. Tribble Blood. Yeah, you magical. Did you hate Star Trek like, into darkness? Yes. I'm leaving. Yep. So <laughs> we're talking about, you know, it's not the greatest film in the world, obviously, but it was fun. It was entertaining. Uh, but this Star Trek Beyond just really felt like it's way, it's, uh, it's jumping the shark in ways that I can't even imagine. And now let me hand it over to the biggest Star Trek sweaty on the panel, <laughs> the man who lives, breathes, and dies Star Trek, the original series. Robert, you have the floor for the next three minutes. I love Star jacket, Trek Beyond. By the way. I, 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 I work awesome. for that. Here's the thing. I you made say. like the fifth best Star Trek movie. Yeah. Well, uh, that's right. Here's what Free thank Enterprise. You, I, thank no. you very much. I would say you are correct. I think Star Trek is absolutely dead. And, and this, what they're trying to do is do everything but make a Star Trek movie. They've thrown everything but the kitchen sink into this new franchise. Star Trek started as an action-adventure science fiction show that, that they wagon trained to the stars. It well, couldn't be a Western because they were played out, so let's do an action-adventure mm, science yeah. fiction show. 
But it was an allegorical show where they dealt with interesting, edgy concepts that were supposed to illuminate our lives at the time. They couldn't deal with the Vietnam War directly on TV. It was against standards and practices. So there's a second season episode called The Private Little War, where you've got one side being armed by the Klingons, and Kirk has to decide, is he going to arm the Hill people? And are they going to get into this brutal war that will be endless? So it had something to say about our lives then, now, whenever. These Star Trek movies are a, a feeble attempt to try and grab the youth market by providing them uh, all this stuff that they get in other movies. You know, you hire Justin Lin to make a Guardians. I love Justin Lin. I love Tokyo Drift. I don't care what anyone says. I love the Fast <laughs> and the Furious movies because they're kind of like Star Trek with cars, a multinational cast, you know, men and women together doing something cool. Well, these Star Trek movies are this weird sort of a, they're grabbing the millennials and they think, ooh, they love action, so let's put action in it. No, what Star Trek fans want is a great story that's relevant, that like everybody else, you wanna see great characters responding to really interesting events and, and something really unique happens that somehow makes you think, wow, you walk out of the theater going, I never thought of it that way. And you wanna see these characters come back. I don't think there are new Star Trek fans for these movies. I think these are just movies now that are placeholders for the next studio franchise picture, whether it's Jack Ryan or whether it's Mission Impossible or whatever, because they're not, they don't have their own identity. And if, you know, you should reboot this and use the action adventure context, but throw something in it that's relevant to today. Make this movie about something. There's nothing intellectually engaging about that new Star Trek trailer. You don't look at it and go, wow, that was really interesting. Where you watch Apocalypse say, you know, you knew me by many names, Ra, Krishna, Yahweh. And you're like, oh my God, has, has he been around? You know, he got that from when, when Havoc says he got that from the Bible or uh, the Bible get it from him. Get it from him. And then you're like, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's what genre filmmaking is all about. Making you think. There's nothing in this movie except that scene between nobody even talks to each other in that trailer. Right. You don't know what that movie's about either. There's right. no there's no narrative no, at all. No, no at ship, all. no crew. Stuff exploded and there's a girl there now. Here we go and he's jumping. There's no plot. Sabotage. The there's there's no no trailer. Trailer. And That's why true. why blow plot. up the Enterprise? Why right. do they have to blow up? It's like they're so bankrupt with ideas. It's like they've ooh, already done that before. The Enterprise doesn't get blown up until Kirk blows her up. To, you know, to turn death into a fighting chance to live. You don't just casually destroy one of your great characters Robert, for no reason at speaking all. Speaking about casually Sorry. destroying characters, let's talk about Deadpool, the brand new viral marketing campaign they've got going on. So we've got the Merc with a Mouth has got a brand new fun campaign going on where like every day right now they're doing something crazy online. A really fun, strange marketing campaign that's been, I think, great to introduce a character that no one, except comic book nerds or people who go to conventions are always like, why is that guy in the red and the black walking around? And lots of fans, I think, the, the, trying to do this movie and rebooting a character that was introduced in Wolverine X-Men Origins in a horrible way, yet now they've got an actual movie with this character, and it, true to true to actually the comic book, the way the character's written, John, what do you think about this viral marketing campaign? It's incredible. It's it's absolutely incredible. I mentioned this on Movie Talk the other day. I said the marketing campaign for Deadpool will end up being in my top ten favorite films of 2016. Whether the movie will or not, I'm not sure. We got to see it. That poster is the greatest poster of the year, though. The double entendre and the way right. till you get a load of me. I I absolutely love that poster. They have hit on all cylinders of the market. Once again. The movie might suck. It, it absolutely. I might can't suck. believe that poster is even allowed out. I know right. the MPAA little, would never allow that. They poster must not out. have got it. It must have gone right. over their heads or under their chins. But I, <laughs> here's here's the thing. I cannot believe how completely spot on with every from Ryan Reynolds's. Did you see his Halloween video they do with the little <laughs> with kids? With the little kids, amazing. The, everything they have done has been a direct response to what fans of Deadpool have been asking for. Forever. Now, mm -hmm. whether that's going to translate well once the actual movie hits and whether or not that translates well in financial success, I know you're predicting 100 million opening weekend. Mm -hmm. I think that's ambitious, but I think it's going to do really well. We still have to see. But as far as the marketing goes, they've crushed it. But the thing is, is that Fox marketing who crushed it? Who came up with this campaign? Whoever, it's too ballsy. Whoever this did does not this seem like a publicly held company <laughs> would do this kind of a campaign. They for should their be movie. hired. Whoever did this viral marketing campaign should be in charge of whoever wants to actually win over fans. The, whoever's doing this is genius. What do you think about this, Max? I think it's really funny. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I thought the first trailer for the movie was really bad and not funny and kind of like looked like a sort of sticky stupid, poorly directed piece of shit. But then 
I don't know. I, I think due to this, I'm going to see the movie. <laughs> <laughs> which is it, Viral marketing campaign is working. I, I guess it's working on me. I, I, I like Deadpool. I really liked the early, when he early had his own comic with T-Ray and uh, what was the old woman who lived with him named? Oh, she's in the movie. Blind yeah, old yeah. woman. Uh, I, I really remember. liked all that stuff, but you know, I, I don't know. I it's. I guess I'm jaded because I'm like, wow, this is great. <laughs> well, why am I? Like, I, know, I know. Show me more of the movie. Right. Show me less of this stuff that you wrote by yourself for fun, and show me the stuff they actually signed off on. Hey, look, I, don't I, know. I, I will be seeing it. it's coming out. I think it's February. February. Right? So yeah. you know, I'm I, really, I know that because of viral marketing. Right. I I'm really, excited. I really hope that they do keep this breaking the fourth wall like this Ferris Bueller's Day Off kind of like approach that is in the comic and that's what is so special. And I think it's so special because you have someone who's comedic gold like Ryan Reynolds. I think letting him riff and letting him come up with stuff as this character is something he could never do as Green Lantern. I mean, this is like, this is a character that that guy is born to play. You know why? He's Canadian. So well, I throw that out there. So Shatner. Yeah, these Canadians, I don't know what we're going to do with them. Hey, let, let's go on to something I like to call minor mutations, where it's a bunch of news items, and we're just going to pick the ones we want to talk about. Number one, we got C. Robert Cargill, also known as Massa Worm from Ain't It Cool, he used to write for that, is the final writer of the Doctor Strange film. We got some pics from the set, and he's finally admitted, hey, I'm the fourth writer of the screenplay. We had John Spates and uh, two other writers before him, but he's been working on it for the last half year. Hopefully, it's going to be great. Doctor Strange is one of my favorite characters. Number two, we got Spider-Man versus is Darth Maul coming out on the newest superhero beatdown. If you haven't had a chance to watch it, it's a bunch of like uh, just fans who are, who are making these insane like Wolverine fighting Batman. You have Batman fighting Darth Vader. You have Spider-Man versus Darth. It's really fun to see all these characters and these little quick. You had Thor fighting Superman and they have some pretty good special effects. So check out Spider-Man fighting Darth Maul. You got Elektra. She's seen in some blurry behind the scenes pics from Daredevil season two. They, obviously they've got Daredevil. They've got uh, Punk Punisher in there, and now you have Elektra. Kate Blanchett is in talks to be in Thor Ragnarok. Is she cast as Hela? Who is she going to be? I certainly hope she's in it. She's a great actress. Is that you a got, butt? Uh, what? For Hela? Is that picture of Hela's butt? Well, what, I don't know. Hela's butt be looking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another, a whole other issue of like the drawings, but we've got that vision. Thor deleted fight scene is now on the deluxe Blu-ray, that fight that uh, I got a chance to see when I was watching them shoot Avengers Age of Ultron. You can actually check out the entire cut scene now. It's on the Blu-ray, the deluxe one that he just came out with. And lastly, we've got Paul Rudd. He's back writing Ant-Man and the Wasp. So what are these stories uh, excite you, Robert? Well, look, I'm a huge Electra fan. I love Frank Miller. I love everything he's ever written regarding Electra. Definitely. Not everything Frank Miller's ever written. Right. Yeah. But I love the Electra storyline. And look, they didn't do it so well in the live action no. Daredevil movie. And I think uh, I think with the long form again, it'll let's play that story out. I want to see the hand. I want to see ninjas. Why can't somebody make a movie when Wolverine, the last Wolverine came out, you think, okay, Wolverine's gonna fight a bunch of ninjas. No. It they cut happen. it out. They cut it was, the whole scene it was out. Like, he, he gets captured by ninjas and then they go away. <laughs> I want to see the hand. I want to see lots of ninjas on the rooftops in New York. Give me that. Right on. How about you, Max? Any of these stories uh, speak I'm to excited you? for the second season of Daredevil 100%. I thought the first season ended weekly, but right up until the ending, I thought it was really great. I think there was a great scene of television mm. in the first season. I didn't think it was a great TV show. I thought it was a good TV show, but I thought there, the scene where the consigliere has her trapped and they're at the table together. That was, was a great. wonderful scene of television mm -hmm. and the hallway fight and a lot of the characters. And the Ben Ben Urich, that moment with him oh. and Fisk. I don't want to give away spoilers. It wasn't but scary. That wasn't scary enough. There's a lot of Marvel stuff, and I suspect Jessica Jones will be the same way when I eventually watch it. That's like, wow, this is so dark. If you haven't seen Sopranos, this is so dark. <laughs> if you haven't seen Breaking Bad, you know, it's dark for dummies, but uh, it's good. And like fun, it's just PG, hard PG-13. And I'm excited for Punisher. I actually, if, I feel like I've been very negative on this show no. so far. <laughs> I, I'm very excited for the second season of Daredevil. I'm gonna watch it the day it comes out. His name is John Bernthal. He reminds me of the John Romita Jr. Punisher. He He's does, even got that he? nose. It's like, for me, it's exciting. Like they finally got a guy who not only looks like my version of the Punisher, but he, now that I've seen Daredevil, he's in a great series. So for a nerd like me, I'm so excited, especially I have the whole run of Daredevils. I, I loved Frank Miller's run. I love the Mazza Kelly art. So there's like that. And then you see Punisher done right. 
it's a win for me. I just I'm I'm hoping it's great. How about you, John? Uh, two things stand out to me. Number one, Kate Blanchett to me is undisputably one of the top five actresses breathing on the planet Definitely. today. So whenever you get somebody of that talent, and how they use her in Thor, that could be a whole another ball game. But it's never a it's never bad news to hear great talent has become connected to a film like this. So if this pans out, if she signs on. I almost don't even care who she's going to play. Right. She could play the milkman for all I care. If she delivers <laughs> Thor's mighty Odin milk or whatever it is that she brings him, I'll be fine with that. And then the other story that stands out to me, I am unapologetically a huge fan of this past year's Ant-Man. Mm. I, I love it more than most of my friends like. I got some friends who don't even like it at all. But I just enjoyed myself. It's not in my top five Marvel films yet, right. but... I really enjoyed it. I had a lot more fun with that movie than I thought I would, especially after all the mess with Edgar Wright. Right. And understanding that Rudd had such a large part to play in, in writing the script with, with those other guys as well. The fact that he's coming back, that's good news to me. And I believe those there were a couple writers who really didn't get credited for the first one, and they are being brought back, Definitely. and they're going to be credited as well. That that bodes well for me. I agree with all the points. You all know, right. the, the Kate Blanchett thing I wanted to say, I watched her on the behind the scenes of the Battle of Five Armies. Mm -hmm. She's a sweaty. Like, she's a total unabashed fangirl. Yes. And I don't think it really has ever been indicated such. But I think that... You're calling that, her out. I think I am. I'm calling Kate Blanchett out. I think that she wanted to be on Thor because someone said, would you do this? And she's like, heck yeah. Yeah. I bet she cut her fee. I bet she did it for, for a song. Everyone has to for Marvel. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I, uh, right? I, think, uh, I think I'm excited to see her because she, you know, she brings that joie de vivre. Mm. I want to see some Galadriel action in, uh, I, in, in the new Thor. I think we will. And let's I love any time Kate Blanchett makes evil faces. Yeah. All of her like, all of her like, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, that sounds wonderful. Well, if she you hadn't a... seen Cinderella, by the way, her She's... as the wicked stepmother was freaking awesome. And she, she was, was so uh, she was one of the the few things that I actually liked about Indiana Jones and the giant skull thing. <laughs> yeah, so, I love Indiana Jones. Yeah. Not many giant people know thing. that that was the alternate. Yeah, the, uh, the, the other title, the giant Jones, skull thing. The Force Awakens. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of the Force, let's talk about a flashback. We're going on a flashback. This week, it's Hellboy 2. It came out in 2008. It's the second installment in the Adventures of Hellboy, directed by the amazing Guillermo del Toro. As always, brings a bunch of amazing designs and creatures, and gr bigger, badder, and in my opinion, better than the first Hellboy. Guillermo got to have some fun this time, expanding the roles of Abe Sapien, Liz, and the really fun ectoplasmic Johan Krauss. Hellboy gets a little closer to his final destiny, which I don't know if we'll ever see in Hellboy 3, but first he's got to fight these golden army dudes. Let's talk about Hellboy 2. You're memories max what about you what are your thoughts about hellboy 2 i feel like i have to be negative about everything i think all of the designs in this movie are incredible i love when they go to moss eisley and there's <laughs> oh yeah and there's the cathedral guy and all those fun aliens uh, i thought this movie was really dorky and alienating and i didn't really care about anyone or anything in it and the fact that you were supposed to kind of feel bad for the villain with the sister and the stabbing and like spoilers, but like they I just, come back in Star Trek Beyond. Yeah, so. they do. They're, so they're back. <laughs> well, you know, can I just say with stripes? One of the first notes you get as a screenwriter at a studio is that you need an entry point character, a character who's somewhat relatable. And the first movie had that like limp dick white guy mm -hmm. who was like along for the ride with them and did nothing meaningful. Right. And you lo you got to enjoy Hellboy and Liz and Ave and like have fun. And everything got explained to this white guy. And because of that, he could have been a black guy. He could have been a black girl. He could have been an Asian guy. He was just a guy. And he was learning about this world. I don't even remember if he's in this movie or if he just gets killed super fast. But man, do I not care about a, if a big red man is going to fuck a pyrokinetic. I don't give a shit. I like Hellboy. But this, I mean, like I like the comic because it's... I'm the point of entry in the comic. My imagination is letting these people come to life. When well, I have to watch it on the screen, and then the robots, where are the big gold robots? I just, for me, I found it like Blade 2 to be totally alienating. And like, this is not for me. Whereas like Guillermo's other stuff, like Devil's Backbone, mm -hmm. amazing, like emotional. And I don't know, I found, I think this, I think this movie is dorky. <laughs> Robert, how about you? Well, I, in a way, I kind of feel similar to what you said. I mean, I love the Hellboy comics. I've got the hard covers. I think they're beautifully done. Mignola's a, a great artist. Um, I think Ron Perlman is probably the greatest casting coup in history yeah. to play Hellboy. There's nobody else who could play him. He looks, 
He looks like Hellboy. Yeah. But again, I watch these films and I don't I don't feel anything. Whereas I love Devil's Backbone. I love Pan's Labyrinth. I even like Kronos. If you oh, will. I like Kronos too. And I can't tell you how much I love Pacific Rim. I have so much love for Pacific Rim. A lot of people don't. You and I are different. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I love the uh, I love Pacific Rim. But these movies, I watch them and I find them strangely distancing. I can't get into them. Maybe it's, I don't have any point of entry because it's not. I don't have my imagination. You're watching everything, and I don't think that the characters. They don't, they don't have the interplay that I'd want from a movie like this. But again, the designs, I'll watch them just for the eye candy. But by the time you get to the end of, of Hellboy 2, I'm watching all this stuff. It's like watching, I don't know, a, a ballet. Right. You're not really involved, but you're, you're, you appreciate the artistry and how beautiful it is. John, how about you? Well, in the realm of Guillermo del Toro sequels, uh, whereas I actually like Blade 2 better than Blade 1, I, and I do like... Hellboy 2. I do. I like Hellboy 2, but it's not, I, I didn't find it as good as Hellboy 1. To me, the missing element, because there was a lot of very cool elements they introduced, but they couldn't compensate for what I felt was the missing element that was in Hellboy 1. And that was the grounding thing to me of the relationship between Hellboy and his dad, his father. John that, Hurt. Yeah, that, that relationship to me is what made the movie to me. Because you have Hellboy, who's this just frantic badass, who's just doing this stuff, wants to be tougher than he is, all this, but when his father's in the room, his, his whole life becomes about wanting ultimately to make his dad happy. And it, it, his biggest fear is to be a disappointment to his father. And that, a lot of people don't talk about that aspect of that movie. And to me, it's the grounding aspect of all of it. And that relationship is very noticeably missing from the second one. It compensates a little with some great creature designs, some good action, um, stuff like, I, I love the stepped up role of Abe in it as well, but it didn't make up for that. So while I like Hellboy 2, to me, was a little bit of a downgrade. So for myself, the reason I like Hellboy 2 better than Hellboy 1 is that for myself, the creatures are the monsters, are the winners. For my, Just for me, I didn't even care about the story. I got bored with the giant robots at the end. I love Pacific Rim 2, but like the Golden Army, I didn't care about it. For me, it was like, going into the what you were calling the Moss Eisley, that secret weird tavern with all the weird monsters that live underground. The designs of the weird plant creature that they have to fight in the yeah, city. Yeah, the that. bizarre multi-eyed demon creature. The rock thing that's on an island that opens up and they go inside the tomb. V visuals like that to me are a feast. And, and I'm more forgiving of films like Hellboy 2. I didn't really care about the story that they had Johann Krauss, this bizarre ectoplasmic guy that was voiced by Seth MacFarlane. He's a weird character that they introduced such I bizarre- I didn't realize Seth MacFarlane yeah, did the voice of that. So That's many interesting. bizarre, interesting characters in it. Yes, I agree the story wasn't that great. I liked it better though than Hellboy because I liked the, the relationship he had with his dad, but I, I felt for myself, it wasn't strong enough and they and they, in Hellboy 1, they just put way too much pressure on, what was his name, Gargamel, or whatever the weird creature Gargamel. was, that kept replicating, they oh, kept uh, fighting the that same Gargamel. His, his dumb gray yeah. looks like everything, this guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, it was like, what now, in one, in the first scene that he fights him in, in the train station, it's just one of them, and he's like getting his ass kicked, and then at the end of Hellboy, he's fighting a thousand of them, and he's kicking all of their asses. Agent Smith disease. Yeah, Agent Smith disease, thank you. So for myself, I found Hellboy very, it's not not one of my favorites for Hellboy 2 it is a step way above for, mm. for myself for Hellboy uh, you know I'd love to see them I know we know that it's not going to happen because Guillermo wants like 200 million dollars I, I wish that they could just say look we can make Hellboy for 50 million Hellboy 3 and like get the, the, the finish get to the finish line I don't know now if I care that much to see a Hellboy 3 I feel like I've got all the comics I'm cool. I don't need to see a movie. I've got the comics. So, all right, let's move on. Speaking of comic books, we're going to go to Spotlight. Every week, I like to uh, highlight a comic book that I think could be turned into either a television series or movie. This week, we've got The Death Ray by Daniel Klaus. This week's uh, Spotlight is Daniel Klaus is fantastically strange. I mean, we, we've uh, seen his work already adapted in Ghost World and Art School Confidential. With this story, he tracks two friends, Andy and Louie, and their lives from kids to adults and the relationship with a Death Ray toy gun that may or may not have magical powers to make people disappear. All right, you guys, I don't know if you've been able to check out the Death Ray, but let's talk about Daniel Klaus's work in general. Uh, would this book or his other works, like Velvet Glove, Cast and Iron, which is another one of my all-time favorites, I'd love to see that. Let's talk about uh, Death Ray. Did you get a chance to read it? I didn't get a chance to read it, but okay. I'm a huge, I was a huge Ghost World fan, and yeah. I think Ghost World remains one of the great comic cinematic adaptations that people don't ever talk about. They're like, right. is that based on a graphic novel? Right. I mean, people don't know that, but it's a gra I love his offbeat sensibility. But now, 
you maybe want to go get this. I it's will go really get this good. this week. It's really fun. Yeah, this is just all this part of the show is doing is functioning for me as an ad for the death ray. Like, I'm now going to go buy this. Right. <laughs> I don't know. Then my work here is complete. He's got two. What's his other, what's his other adaptation? Uh, uh, Ghost World and then Art School Confidential. It was based off a four-page part in his comic book called Eight Ball. And when I was in art school, that came out. And I was like, ah, they're making fun of that person. Ah, they're making fun of that person. Oh, they're making fun of me. It laser beamed every single stereotype <laughs> of artist that exists. And it was so acidic. Acidic is, you know, I'm the, it was perfect. And his writing style is infused with this beautiful way of looking at the world and turning it slightly upside down with a fun, like poking bitter edge. There's I a mean, sorted, a sorted casualness. Mm, yes, like sorted. Sort of I love that. Mean, yeah. A mean caustic era of normalcy. Yes. So the Death Ray also has that. I highly recommend it. I also highly recommend like a velvet glove cast in iron. It's one of the weirdest and most amazing. It's if David Lynch wrote and drew a uh, tell a, a series. I guess he wouldn't have drawn it, but it's very it's very Lynchian. Let's say that. John, did you get a chance to check out Death Ray? No, I have not okay. had a chance to check out the Death Ray, but I am going to check it out now. All right. Well, that was my public service announcement. I guess if you guys haven't already, I read it. I love Daniel Klaus's stuff. Check his stuff out. Definitely check out the Death Ray. You could probably get it on Amazon or go to your local comic book store and buy it in person. All right, we're going to hit the Twitter questions. We got a lot of questions. A lot of people wrote in for Max. Before we get to the Twitter questions, I myself personally have a question for Max. Yeah. I would love to talk about Superman American Alien. Now, your book yeah. comes out tomorrow. It is a, it's a fantastic, amazing origin story of the Man of Steel, of Clark Kent, of the story of Superman, but done with such a refreshing, at least for myself, who's read so many comics, to see someone take this character and kind of re-envision them in such a unique and startling way. I wrote you earlier this month and told you how much I, really I love I love yeah. the comic book. I'm happy you're here. Tell us about American Alien, Superman. What inspired you to do this? Issue two comes out tomorrow. As most nerds know, comic books come out on Wednesday. So go to your comic book store and buy issue two. But they might even have issue one. I know it's sold out, but they yeah, might have it reprints. Did really, it did surprisingly yeah. well. So let's talk about Superman, American Alien for a minute. Well... <laughs> Uh, I've talked about it a lot. Superman is incredibly close to my heart. Uh, I love the idea of a, I'll do like the quick version of what I always say, which is I love the idea of a superhero who's doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do and it doesn't cost him anything. And I, I, anytime you've helped someone open a door cause they were carrying too many bags, you didn't, a, a, a criminal didn't have to close a door on your parents to make you realize that was the right thing to do. Anytime you've helped a friend set up a party, anytime you have introduced someone in your career to another person who you knew could help them, anytime you've done something good for someone else, you know that that feels good. And on some level, if you're not a prick, if you could fly and were super strong, eventually I think you'd get to a point where it's like, Oh, on TV, there's a wildfire and a bunch of people are trapped somewhere. I can get there in five minutes, deal with that, and be back in time for this Tinder date. And like <laughs> something about that element of the character, I don't feel, I, and I love a lot of Superman books that exist, but I don't feel anyone's ever gone like, who the fuck is this guy? Like, what the fuck is going on? And so what I wanted to do is the anti Dark Knight Returns, the anti, the, the least iconic Superman story ever told. I wanted to approach Superman like I was the only person who'd ever read a Superman comic and had been given, like it was some obscure comic from the 1930s <laughs> and I've been given the job to reboot it. And I wanted to write it like an indie comic about a, an alien from another planet and there's no guarantee that he'll be Superman in my comic. Ignore the pre-release covers. Yeah, uh, you know, it is no guarantee. It's just about a guy named Clark Kent who crashes in a pod, has no idea where he came from, and what happens to him from there, and the sort of guy he is. It's a very you'll see in the first one he's a little boy. But as the as the issues go on, you'll see that my version of Clark is incredibly idiosyncratic. He's a very specific guy, and his reactions to things maybe aren't what you're trained to expect from Clark. And I'll tell you why that is, because you're not, ex ex you, you haven't been trained to expect anything from Clark. He's, Clark Kent is a, a guy who is Superman. Why, this is the thing, this is the thing. And I've always thought this. If I lived in the DC universe, 
I would not believe that Superman had a secret identity. People say he's wearing glasses, so it's dumb. I would never fucking believe that you <laughs> were Superman. Even if you look just like Superman, he can fly, he's God. Why would he have a job? And the answer is because super, being Superman isn't who Clark Kent is. That's a side hustle that he does mm. because it's nice. That's him doing charity work. He has a job, he has ambitions, he wants to be a good reporter and he wants to talk to smart people because there's nothing he finds more rewarding than talking to smart people. Because he's smart, but he's not Lex Luthor smart. Man, if he could get an interview with Lex Luthor. <laughs> Man, if he could talk to Oliver Queen. Like, these guys are really interesting. And I, I don't know, that's what Superman American Alien is. And I'm just ranting now because it's the most exciting thing I've ever done. And it, let me let me say it's one of the more exciting comics that I've had a chance to read this year. And that's why it's very special to me to promote it. Because like we were talking about with television versus movies, we also have comics. And a lot of comic books now are being reverse engineered by the big companies because they're like, look, the movies are coming out. We have Civil War. So they're forcing Civil War, which has already been a comic and was very famous. That's why this comic, the movie's called Civil War. They're making a Civil War too, or a civ So they're forcing comic books to imitate the movies which is the reverse engineering that makes no sense why we have all these amazing characters and why we have all these amazing stories is because they allowed writers and artists to take chances in the comic books and that's where all these stories that are coming from from are, that are based these movies are based on so i think that when you when you allow creatives to take a chance like dc let max take a chance with this character let him take his own spin on it it's a very unique spin but man does it feel like superman to me like it feel when i read it i felt like that is what clark would do if he was a little kid i like the way he wrote the parents they're smart but they're real and i like the that you become empathic with this character who is basically a god who's discovering that he's a god and also a man and, and it's imbuing him with these essences of humanity that normally are not allowed this just it feels like I, I have a really hard time picking up whatever issue the most random issue of superman or batman is because they're like not only are they crossed over with 400 infinity flashpoint crisis and whatever thing you know they're trying to like upsell all these things but they're not allowing the stories to just naturally unfold uh, i think uh, what robert do you have anything i to wanted add? to ask you i mean you were given the most iconic comic character of all time by a corporately owned entity did you get any pushback? Yes, there have been there have been big moments of pushback. It's funny. I want to sneak in something here before I answer this question, which is that if you haven't seen his movie Free Enterprise, it oh. does something similar to American Alien tonally, which is it presents the fans of something in a way you are not used to seeing them presented. And thank I, you. I don't want to spoil it, but it's very important that you see it because it's very good and it's one of the better real movie movies about people who like science fiction and are fans of something, as opposed to something like Mama's Grandma's Boy or Fanboys or any of that. It actually feels real and it's a real movie. And that's what I'm trying to do with Superman. Well, so, thank you. But, but, but to answer your question, yes, there have been moments of pushback and they are few and far between. I mean, as you'll see in the second issue, we get violent. We get like Vertigo comics violent, mm, wow. uh, except like, but the, it's always weird pushback. Like my favorite, my favorite thing of pushback is that I've had happen so far was in the sixth issue, the cover originally was a guy pushing open a bathroom stall and Clark halfway, you know, when you're trying to get dressed really quickly and you're like legs caught in your pants and your shirt and you're, you know, like it was Clark halfway into Superman with like his cape over his head right. like that. And, and they were like, they were like, you can't do that. It makes Superman look foolish. And I was like, what? Like, oh, it man. makes him look cute, relatable. Yeah. And so then my second comic was it's him and his, you know, he's Clark Kent. He doesn't have that much money. He has like a two, he has a one bedroom in like past New Troy. He can't afford New Troy prices. So he's like on that, you know, the uptown metropolis. And, and he's like, he's in his apartment and it was a cover where he's in the Superman costume and Superman's on, uh, like a, there's a big picture of Superman that someone painted that he bought for his apartment. And in the picture, Superman's like that. And it's Clark Kent standing in front of a full length mirror like that, wearing the Superman shirt, but then just boxers. He's not wearing pants. And he's like that. And uh, Lois Lane's like this in bed, like laughing. And they were like, that makes him look stupid. And I was like, what? 
What do you, you've had him kill people. He's been a communist hitman. Like what? <laughs> you've had Superman murder people and turn evil, but I can't have him have be silly with his girlfriend. Uh. And so like, you know, there are moments where there's pushback, but overall I'm working with a guy named Alex Antone, who's my editor, who's great. And everyone's been like, hey, you want him to get drunk on a boat and fuck a stranger? <laughs> you want you want him to get into a fight with one of his friends where he's just wrong and being kind of a dick? Go for it. And I keep I'm not allowed to get him actually drunk. So in the series, I get him drunk in two different ways. And they're like the most bullshit, like Star Trek techno babble, like, <laughs> and now the midichlorians and he's oh, drunk. No. <laughs> and and DC went like I was like before I just had him drinking, but they were like, can't be drunk. And I was like, the midi chlorians. And they're like, okay, he's drunk. Nyquil. Yeah. Just slamming Nyquil. Nyquil. Just like, <laughs> it's, it's just him guzzling purple drink. Mm. But thank thank you. I heard right DC on. had a little bit of pushback on you that uh, because I, originally you were going to have Clark Kent eventually becomes John Cena. Yeah. Was that true? Yeah. That yeah was... Originally, Clark Kent was going to slowly transform into the doctor of thugonomics. And from there, <laughs> hero to the people, uh, the nicest, sweetest, kindest, gentlest man alive. <laughs> John Cena, <laughs> and like, let's go to let's we're gonna move on to the Twitter questions, but definitely check out Max's wrestling is it wrestling as please, well. Yeah. Um, first question from Twitter comes: Tim Barnes asks, "Do you think Iron Man will die before Avengers: Infinity War?" Let's rapid fire through these. Max, what do you think? No, no, John? not a chance. No, no. Okay. Stacy Reynolds asks, "Do you think there will ever be a reboot of Spawn? Spawn the movie is I think what she's talking about." Max, yes. yes? Uh, not major wide release. No. Robert. I think yes, probably. TV. Yeah, that's uh, that's more TV likely. would make a lot of sense. It was actually started as an animated series. Check it out. It was a pretty cool animated series on HBO. Alejandro Suarez asks, hey, John, do you think we'll see a Darkman reboot? I really love that. Darkman, the Sam Raimi. Max? I don't, but we should. Yeah. Same answer. I don't, but we should. Yep. We've love got it. Ash versus the Evil Dead, something I never thought would happen on TV. I can see Darkman coming yeah. back. I would love to see Darkman come back as a television series. I think it would be fantastic. It's got that Mission Impossible wearing the mask with some superhero freakishness and, and the power of kick-ass. He's d damaged, so he doesn't feel pain. You got Electric Boogaloo asking, would you like to see a New Gods movie? Hell yes. And if so, who would you like to see direct it? Now, for myself, I'm going to throw a, a weird one out there. I would love to see Darren Aronofsky tackle the new gods. I think yeah, he's I, already dropped a couple. No, I know, but it's like I thought about it and I was like, give him a shot. I mean, I, it would just be, it would, I think it could work. What about you, Robert? Takashi Miyake? Is that yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. I would like to see him, his version That's of a new god. The movie. director of audition. That's a, a good one. How about you, Max? Sean Sono. Nice. Another great choice. Another good choice. <laughs> love. All right. How about you? Oh gosh, um, I would I, actually. I'd be kind of curious to see the the crank guys, uh, Neville Dean and Taylor, take a crack at it. I think that would be kind of manic. That would be manic and crazy. All right, next question. Steve Stark asks, and this is for Max as well. Uh, let's just direct it to Max. If, if you could write or direct one superhero, male or female franchise, who would it be and why? Moon Knight. Moon Knight. How about oh, I, I can't believe I was just going to say that. I, I actually wrote a Moon Knight screenplay when I was in high school. Nice. Oh, yeah. About it was the Moon Knight origin story and, and issue twenty five of the Menchus and Kevich version with the Black Specter. Nice. But jo if I didn't do Moon Knight, because you said Moon Knight, I, I would probably do Atari Force. There you go. I would love to see you rock that Atari Force. How about you? Well, it kind it's a it's a bit of a cop out because it kind of became X Men First Class. I wanted to see that standalone. They originally planned an X-Men Origins Magneto, mm, uh, right. which I thought, and that kind of evolved into X-Men First Class, but I really would have liked to see them just put everything else aside, just focus on that. That would have been great. You know what? I would also make Moon Knight a woman. Well, nice. Struggling with mental illness and Egyptian gods. I would <laughs> pick uh, Machine Man, Jack Kirby's Machine Man, and make it really about identity crises. So next on, we'll pick Abdul Mo Muhammad asks, do you think if Harley... Harley Quinn is loved in Suicide Squad by audiences. We could see a spinoff, possibly Mad Love. What do you think? Spinoff? No. 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 Yes, possible. They follow the money. Well, how about you? You know what? With Suicide Squad, all bets are off. Right. Who knows? I, yeah. I don't. I have no. I hope the movie's great. It just is so weird looking to me that they even made it. I'm happy to see it, but maybe I, I know. know. I know for a fact that DC is working on an animated Harley Quinn feature film. But so that's going to that's going to be a direct release when Suicide Squad. Squad comes out. Bruce Tim is rocking it, so it's definitely going to have that Bruce Tim flavor. But will she actually get an, a live action Harley Quinn film? I think not. I think it'll go to uh, Birds of Prey. 
is what they would do is like throw Harley Quinn and Batgirl and it couldn't be Oracle. Who was the third one? Huntress? Huntress. Huntress. Yeah. So I would see them doing a Birds of Prey. So I guess that would be, uh, you know, as close as you'll get as a Harley Quinn standalone movie. Next question we got Robert Sudge asks, what comic book arc would you like to see visualized on the big screen? Robert, we'll start with you. Oh, I, give me the Teen Titans Judas contract. I'm so with you. Uh, they're already working on that as an animated I, 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 you'd have to set it up, but I would love to see that. All right. How about you? I mean, it could never exist, but I'd love to see Bruce Wayne murder. Nice. I, I, I really enjoyed that, but it would require a continuity to, to be set up that can't exist. How about you? Well, I'm, they're kind of giving it to us now. I've always wanted Age of Apocalypse. I, I mean, it'll never happen, but I always kind of wanted that. I, this is uh, extra sweaty because Fantastic Four just got demolished, but I would like to see the trial of Galactus. Uh, we'll never see that. All right. Next, we got Wine 101, likes to drink, asks, any chance of a Buckaroo Bonsai getting a reboot? Ma Max? No. 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 Uh, I'll have to say no, but definitely check out the extended edition of the director's cut of the original. You get an extra hour, so sweat it out. An extra hour? Yeah, there's an extra hour. It's amazing. Caleb <laughs> Caleb Lalandi asks, what comic book to TV adaptation are you most excited about? Max? Um, maybe the American Gods mm, TV show definitely. coming up. Brian Fuller's rocking that. How about you? Uh, season two of Daredevil. Right on. Preacher. Yep, Preacher for me. I've All right. got a bad feeling about Preacher. All right, well. I got a bad feeling about Preacher. I'm just saying, I got a bad feeling about Preacher. I got a good feeling about Preacher. I want to read the network notes. All right. We got That's the last. No, you that. don't. That's like yeah. this. No, you don't. Yeah. You never want to read the network notes. They'll make you so sad. I always <laughs> oh, wish no. instead of leaking scripts or stories, they just leaked notes, emails. <laughs> to, to watch the public perception of entertainment change in a day. Oh, God. It would <laughs> burst that bubble so quick. Jesus Christ. Sweaty question of the week comes from Ryan Bogardis asking, do you guys think we will ever see the death and return of Superman arc in the DCEU? Max, let's start with you. What is the DCEU? The uh, DC Expanded or Extended Universe? That's what they call it. Yeah. The movie. Expanded Movies? Yeah. Yeah, I refuse to call it. I just call it yeah. the DC Cinematic, cinematic Universe. universe. Yeah. The it's, expanded universe. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know they're, they're trying to, to be different. Well, we're seeing it. I mean, like, uh, it's, Doomsday's in the trailer, and now he's Zod because it would be too confusing to have them be two different people. And, like, I guess we're just seeing it, and uh, maybe Superman will die at the end, and maybe he won't, and who cares? John? It'll be a different incarnation, but I think they'll get the skeleton of it and probably do a version of it of some sort. Robert? Only if they bring back Shaquille O'Neal as Steel. <laughs> because didn't that character was introduced in yeah, the death of Superman? Yeah, Steel, Steel Superboy, yeah. the Eradicator, and the Cyborg. cyborg. Yeah, I mean, the I best could... Cyborg's the great yes. character. Right, he was a great character. I've got a good answer for that. You can see what you're talking about twice. Number one, you could check out Max Landis' very own made for YouTube special t it's him and it telling and retelling the story of the death and return of Superman. It's That's awesome. the first way you could check, check it out. out. The second way you could check it out is see my documentary, the the I can't the death of Superman, Superman lives. lives. The death what of happened? Superman lives. What happened? I can't even say what it's called. And you can get that right now by going to tdoslwh.com. You can get a digital download, get the Blu-ray, and find out all about the Nick Cage, Tim Burton, Kevin Smith, John Peters. Freight train called Superman Lives, and it was going to actually follow quite closely the death and return of Superman. So check those two out, and that's it for us on episode 37 of Collider Heroes. I'd like to specially thank our amazing guests, starting with John Campia. Where can we find you online, John? Uh, Monday through Friday on Movie Talk, Saturdays and Sundays on Mailbag, Tuesdays here on Heroes, and also on the Flash Recap Show, Thursdays on Jedi Council, Wednesdays on the Rebels Recap Show, and of course, check out my book, uh, The Pride, when it comes out in mid to late January. Robert, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at RM Burnett, Twitter, Burnett RM, or you can find me at SaveTheFederation.com and support Axonar, the crowdfunded Star Trek indie film that I'm working on. Awesome. It won't be dead. Max We're Landis. <laughs> Where can people find you online, Max? Uh, my, my, I'm way simpler. I'm at up to my knees. Uh, buy Am American Alien. It's in comic book stores tomorrow. Please buy it because it's really good. Definitely check out um, Superman American Alien issue two. Go to your comic book stores tomorrow. Buy that and then ask for them to order issue one if they're sold out. Get those comics. They're fantastic reads. I'm John Schnepp. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram just at John Schnepp. And like I said earlier, you can get my film The Death of Superman Lives What Happened by going to www.tdoslwh.com. Get, get one for your friends for Christmas, for the holidays. Get a digital download. Support independent film. You've been watching Collider Heroes. This has been episode 37. I'll see you next week.
Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.